Hi everyone, welcome back for another Wine Spectator two bottle tasting series. We are so fortunate today we get to go to Italy, to the Northwest, to Piedmont, to the hills of Barolo for Marchese de Barolo. Legendary producer, great wines. Um, I'm Keith Goldston, the Corporate Master Sommelier for Landry's. And with me today is Julie Dalton, uh, the head psalm of Masters Houston. Julie, welcome. When I say Barolo, Nebbiolo, what's the first thing that kind of comes to your mind? Oh my gosh, uh, perfume and uh, just an absolutely intoxicating uh, just draw into the glass. Every time I put my nose into a glass of Barolo, I'm so drawn in by its complexity and by its uh, just the aromatics that is that they're just y there's nothing else like a, a glass of Barolo in the aromatics it, it's just um and then and then you get it on the palate and it's like bam 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 it slaps you around a little and you're just like wow what just happened but you love it and you go back again and um you know the structure is crazy but the aromatics it's it just keeps keeps come keeps you coming back at least for me um, and it's, uh, yeah, just to me, it's one of the sexiest wines, period. End of story. Done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other thing too is, you know, as I mentioned, Italy, Northwest corner, Piedmont, South of Turin, North of Genoa, and Piedmont translates to the foot of the hills. So you're at the foothills of the Alps. And it has got to be honestly one of the most stunningly beautiful wine regions on the planet. Um, you have Alba there and what's Alba famous for? Truffles, which are delicious. Nutella comes from that area, which is also delicious. <laughs> and then this grape Nebbiolo, it is honestly, I think, the best spot on the planet for it. It's just that certain spot where certain grapes have their happy spot. And it's something about you know, the really old soils, you know, we've always talked about how great limestone is and there was a, you know, this was all underwater at one point. So we have limestones of different eras, different ages. And there's just something about this grape that it needs a long time to get ripe. Um, and it's just, it's that Goldilocks zone. Like if it's too hot, too cold, it won't do it. You just need this kind of long, slow ripening season. Um, it's oddly, you know, has high tannins, high acid, but then also this perfume and bouquet, and then this crazy ageability. Yeah. And this is one of those grapes that, for a lot of us in the industry, it's like, we'll put it at that, you know, it's like, you know, the King Arthur, you know, it's on the round table of like the top grapes in the world, in my opinion. Like it's Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Syrah, Nebbiolo absolutely should be in that sentence of yeah. what is the greatest red wine grape. And I think no plant place on the planet does it better than Barolo. And I'm sorry, the Barbaresco people are laughing like, ah, <laughs> but you know, there is just something about, okay, I will give it to maybe the Longue, that whole general area is possibly the greatest spot for Nebbiolo. I don't so, think- uh, So Julie, did you want to geek out on the soils for a moment? Well, I was just, I mean, well, tying into that, I just wonder why any other place that has tried to grow Nebbiolo, it's just like, forget about it. It's just not even, there's just no, there's just no chance. And Nebbiolo, I mean, Barolo, Barbaresco, the Longue is, I feel like there are few grapes like that in the world of wine where it's so tied to its place of origin. I mean, can you think of another place where you, you try growing I mean, Tempranillo outside of Spain has some okay expressions, but Nebbiolo outside of Longue, it's just terrible. Did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to say yeah, that. Well, I mean, <laughs> there are some people who probably spend a lot of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears trying to make Nebbiolo in other places. But have you ever tasted one that even comes close? <laughs> no. It, it, the funny part, and I'm just like smiling and laughing a little bit inside is, there's like the bar is so low that if it actually even just tastes like Nebbiolo, you're like, yes, <laughs> you know, but you know, but even that is like a low bar that almost a lot of places don't get. There's just something about that Northwest corner of Italy, this grape and your analogy of it being sexy. Absolutely. But it's also haunting. And, and I love how every time you go into it, especially when we get up like uh, the cruise and we're really lucky we've got one of the single cruiser vineyards of Barolo today, 
they're every bit as exciting, interesting as the Grand Cruise of Burgundy. Um, there is rare, there is scarce, but they have personality, they have soul. Yeah. And I think as you and I taste through so much wines all the time, and there's a lot of great, and we need wines that are just everyday drinkers. But every now and then it's kind of nice when you get something that has a unique voice, a unique soul, and have it show through in the class. So these are absolutely a treat. Yeah. Um, do you think we should bring in Valentina to kind of learn a little bit more about the story of Barolo? I would love, she had, I mean, Marchese de Barolo has such an amazing history and I really can't wait to hear Valentina tell it and how her family has been such a part of it. So um, without further ado, let's bring her in. Hello, Valentina. Hello everyone. So happy to have you. Well, I'm very excited. What an honor to be with you guys talking about Nibbiolo talking about Barolo, you said some uh, beautiful things and uh, surely uh, the fact that Nibbiolo is so needy as a grape was a very clear <laughs> point. <laughs> needy, I like that. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, but also rewarding, you know. For sure. Needy Just and rewarding. Just a neat thing. You work a lot uh in order to have it and then when finally it shows in the glasses so when finally you get the results then there is your satisfaction yeah well valentina your family and i mean it's like it's even like the name of the winery like it, it is such a pillar of borolo would you like to talk a little bit about how did it start because i mean there is definitely kind of there were grapes there for a very long time but borolo didn't become borolo until the 1800s. So what happened? How, how did we end up with such a beautiful wine? Well, I think that this is a story that has to be remembered because not just as beautiful, because it's actually a love story, but we remind it every day while we drink our wines and the wines made in the region of uh, Barolo and Lange most generally. So uh, Barolo was born, as I was saying, because of a love story, the one between the last Marquis of Barolo Carlo Tancredi Falletti and his wife, Juliette Colbert, who was a French noble woman that as soon as she arrived in Barolo in the beginning of the 1800, realized that beautiful grapes were growing on our hills. Yet no one ever thought about making this uh, important still and dry wine, which then became famous as the King of Wine and the Wine of Kings, Barolo, which she named after the village in which she made the wine the first time. So for sure, Juliette was used to the French tradition. Fermentation was completed for the first time. In fact, until the 1700s, when even Thomas Jefferson visited the region of uh, uh, Piemonte, uh, before he was president of the United States, of course, he used to describe the wines enjoyed during his journey, sweet as Madeira, uh, sparkling as champagne, yet austere, just like a Bordeaux. So elements which are very far away compared to the um, imaginary of Barolo nowadays, uh, with the exception, of course, of the great austerity, which is still one of the main characteristics that comes through any expression of Nebbiolo and surely is very much present in Barolo. And this was because the Nebbiolo at the time did not complete fermentation. It was only after Juliette Colbert arrived in the area that she had an underground cellar built in order for um, winemakers to have a place where uh, temperature was more or less stable throughout the seasons. And she introduced wooden barrels for the first time, so to allow finally complete fermentation. And therefore, the uh, still, dry and still austere, uh, Barolo was born. And uh, this beautiful story still is uh, reminded in every glass that we taste of beautiful wine from our regions. Yeah, it's, it, I, I was enjoying looking at the website for, your, for the winery and you're the only winery I've seen where you have a 150 year vintage chart and yeah. It, I love that you can actually like, oh, how was the 18, you know, 93 vintage? And you have that information because there's not many people that have a history like that. So it's pretty spectacular that we have that connection to the past. And then when did your family, you know, become part of the picture? 
Well, surely what you just mentioned is a greater uh, honor, but also a great responsibility because my family <laughs> bought the state of Marquises de Barolo back in 1929. So what happened after Marquise Juliette made her first Barolo and actually made it so famous in the nearby area, especially through the different royal courts uh, of the time uh, by traveling and taking the wine with her, um, uh, they had no children. So the winery was left to a charity organization that Juliette herself set in 1864 before passing away. And this charity organization is still working today under the same rules that Juliette set. So you can just imagine how um, for, foreseeing this woman was and how a strong and uh, independent also in her decisions. So the winery was run for this period of time since 1864 to 90, 1929 by this uh, uh, charity organization called Opera Pia Barolo. And in the meanwhile, other families in the area, in the village of Barolo, started making wine just as Juliette taught them. So including our family, we were living just in front of the castle of the Marquises. So we were seeing, uh, I can just imagine every day, barrels going in and out the cellar of the Marquises and uh, dreamt that this uh, beautiful love story uh, would never die. So uh, when the state was finally um, uh, being sold because charity organization could not run profitable businesses any longer, especially when they had to deal with good transformation. My family that was already quite recognized at the time as a Barolo producer, my great grand uncle was in fact known as the patriarch for Barolo back, in the, back at the time. Um, they bought the state and they moved from their little cellar to the state of the Marquises of Barolo, so just on the other side of the square. And here is where we still live today, where I'm sitting right now, on top of the historical cellars from the Marquises. We still have those barrels left from the 1800s that were used eventually for making the very first Barolo. So, of course, it's a great uh, um, uh, pride to uh, be able to count every vintage that was done since then, since we just moved here to nowadays. But as we were saying, also a great responsibility. I really feel like we have this uh, um, duty to continue the work, uh, the dream that Marquis Juliette had, and uh, continue it in a very present day, still nowadays. So I would say that our motto is to um, combine tradition with innovation. And uh, by saying this, with innovation, I mean being today on a, a contemporary consumer stable and uh, allowing people that have also different taste profiles than um, how they were before to enjoy Barolo. Because of course, things changed since the 18, early uh, 1900s to nowadays. We have different uh, knowledge. Uh, of course, we have uh, different tools. We have greater capability and uh, um, also opportunity of working our land, first of all, and then uh, work the, uh, the fruit of our land, so the grapes in the cellar, in order to, to do this, to still be today very present without forgetting our roots, without forgetting our history and our tradition, but just making this tradition contemporary day by day, generation after generation. Wow. Awesome. Well, should we just take a little break and taste the, the Longue Nebbiola? Because all this talk about it's getting me a little bit thirsty. Um, me too. Julie, what, what notes do you pick up on the, the nose for the, the Longue? Well, first of all, what does sprolio mean? Can you tell us what is there a direct translation, Valentina? What is, what, what, what is that word? Well, it's always a tricky one, but uh, it's uh, made on purpose because Sbirolo in our dialect means uh, um, uh, a person with a uh, character, with a personality, which is quite challenging, very um, loud, uh, easygoing, but at the same time, uh, tough in, his, uh, in its strength. So the fact that the name is challenging is a reflection of the personality of the wine itself. Because of course, uh, we, are, we spoke a lot about this um, great demand 
um, uh, personality, very demanding, I'm sorry, personality of Nebbiolo being, as I said earlier, very needy in terms of the war. But Nebbiolo doesn't grow only in Barolo. Nebbiolo is actually a quite versatile grape that in certain places shows the strength, power, austerity, as it does in Barbaresco and in Barolo even more. But in um, areas like the Lange, as a old, uh, where the soil is uh, more sandy, um, and more mineral, and uh, uh, definitely looser, we have a fresher expression on the Biolo, a more gentle approach of the wine. And surely an, it can be an introduction for uh, people to the Biolo's world and eventually later to Barolo. So you're saying that the soils that you just described, more sandy, uh, so that's the soil that is in this brolio here. So, cause I'm getting a, a much, a much fresher, it just smells a little, not dense is the word isn't that, but it kind of is when you smell the two side by side, the, the, the Sarmasa smells incredibly dense and compact and there's so much stuffing in there. And this one, it's like Nebbiolo at a party. Like it's got its feet up, you know, it's hair down. It's just chilling out. It's enjoying itself. Um, to me, the, the florality is, is certainly there, but it's super uh, like ripe, fresh red fruit, like more strawberry instead of cherry. I don't know if that's, if you're getting that also. Got it perfectly. Red, lots of red licorice and... Yeah, the idea is really to uh, think of a different Nebbiolo, a Nebbiolo which we don't often see because um, mostly is overshadowed by the deeper expression, the more dense expression, as you all said. In this case, we're really looking at a Nebbiolo which uh, wants to enjoy himself and entertain the guests in a more easy, funny, and um, definitely uh, laid back way compared to Barolo. So a lot of red fruits, a lot of uh, freshness, a lot of juiciness. At a, as a matter of fact, we don't even age this wine in wood. It's uh, just stainless steel. So it's really like a grape juice that comes out of the cellar ready in the glass. So to be enjoyed in any moment with any kind of uh, um, pairing, even the most uh, simple one, which usually you don't want to uh, even uh, uh, put together with a big expression of Barolo. But Nebbiolo can be also this, and especially today we have the opportunity of showing this because of the greater um, knowledge in the cellar, the greater know-how, sorry, in the cellar and the greater know-how in the vineyard. So to treat even this more simple Nebbiolo in a simple way, so to have it ready in the glass. So is this a technical declassification of some of your... Um uh more specific vineyards or does this come from where where does this wine come from specifically it comes uh, actually in general by the Lange area so we're not really talking uh, specifically about a vineyard but it's rather a blend of the different vineyards throughout the Lange region uh Lange of course uh, uh, Keith uh, positioned them perfectly where they are and uh, the name Lange uh, means uh, strips of land because of course, million of years ago, all this area was underneath the seaside. So it was basically a seabed. That's why we still have so much sand in our, uh, in our land. And uh, when the sea went away and the hills started to rise, that is when uh, the different strips, so the different hills were formed. And that's why they are so different one from the other, even though they're so close by, because they emerged in different areas, basically. So we have older ones more arose, we have younger ones, it's still very sandy. This is just a general, of course, description. But if we put together all of this, we have a quite sandy area where grapes show um, in a lighter way compared to specific subzones within the Lange, where the soil is more complex. And that is when we find expressions such as Barbaresco and Barolo, as we will taste later. Yeah, well, I would just like to say thank you because I've had quite a few producers, Longes, and it seems like as a category, sometimes they try to use it as their, let's make something super modern, darker, not necessarily that typical for the area. So it's really nice that this 
is a great way, I think, to introduce people to Nebbiolo. And it, it gives you some of the temptation, but without the tannins or the oomph or the density that we'll see coming up here on the Barolo. So thank you for kind of keeping it true to what I think the grape is. And I know for like, if I was in a restaurant selling it to consumers, like this is something I could take someone who likes Pinot Noir mm -hmm. and be true. like, how about something a little bit, you know, or if you're looking at maybe a, you know, a Chateauneuf de Pop, a Grenache mm -hmm. base, like here is something that there's another option for you. And I yeah, think it's a really delicious and probably pairs beautifully with food. Like I, I feel like I, could crush a bottle pretty easily in That's the right That's exactly what I was thinking, Keith. Like the, if this is like Pinot Noir with a kick, but a little more, a little more spice, a little more, a little more punch. And it's a fun way to yeah. take people outside of their comfort zone. But this is exactly the idea. I think that this is the wine uh, that reflects uh, our motto, meeting uh, a tradition with innovation. Because, of course, as you said, it's very traditional. It's Nebbiolo, so one of the most classic grapes of our, uh, of our region, made in a very traditional way, still showed in a more, it's not even modern, it's just a, a more friendly approach. So that even people that are just curious, that maybe have to be a little bit pushed in order to get to um, get out of their comfort zone and can be challenged in tasting something new, can really open their mind and uh, explore the region of uh, Piemonte and the important grapes that sometimes can sound a little bit scary because we think of this appellation Barolo is, has a big name, it fools your mouth just as the wine, but at the same time, it, it keeps you a step away because there is so much um, attention to it and also so much, uh, um, how can I say, um, now words don't come to me, I'm sorry, but it's a, a very uh, like noble appellation. So you want to show respect and always stand a step behind. With this wine, you can enter immediately in confidence, get to discover the grape and then move on. Absolutely. And moving on, I think I it's kind of fun that we go from, you know, the regional wine to now we're going to a single vineyard, a single crew in Barolo itself. And this wine just year in, year out is absolutely spectacular. So Julie, why don't you go ahead and take us through the nose on this Barolo because there's just so much happening here. It's more, there's just layers and layers and layers. So in addition to the red fruit, there's black fruit and it's a little bit more taut. Um, to me, there is uh, like an Amaro note, almost um, like a Campari, Finet Branca, like a, like a root, uh, um, like a bark uh, uh, infusion um, and flowers for days. I mean, it's just so sexy. I just can't, I just can't. I mean, I mean, of course, the leather and the tar and the um, all of the the roses are there, but but there's it's there's just more to it than that, and it's it's just it's every time you go into the glass, you get something else, and that's that's what I love about that's what I love about Barolo in general. Um, but um, and then stones, rocks, rock dust, um, coffee, tobacco. I mean, I could go on and on and on. It's just, um, yeah. That, that was amazing. That was, it, it was such a joy watching you go into that glass and just another thing, another thing, another thing, and just finding so much. And I love kind of that it's not all there unless you keep looking. And it reminds me a little bit of like after your parents put you to bed and then you're not tired. So you sneak back out and you like look through the door to like watch a little TV while they're still up. And you get like glimpses of what's happening in the television. And um, this wine reminds me of that where every time it just keeps opening up, sharing a little bit more. You're like, oh, yeah, that's there. That's there. And it just to me, that's a sign of quality and it's a sign of ageability. And um, I'd be very curious to hear Valentina's take because I've always found for me Barolos and Nebbiolos, the really good ones actually get bigger as they age. And it's kind of crazy because if you look at Cabernet, you look at Pinot Noir, they lose their fruit as they age. But it's almost like Nebbiolo gets bigger and better and 
more powerful. So Valentino, what, what's your thoughts on age, aging Barolos, Nebbiolos, and uh, these incredible wines? Well, it's a really interesting evolution, the one that Nebbiolo has, especially when it comes to Barolo expression, which is, uh, we can say, the maximum expression that Nebbiolo uh, can show in terms of power, in terms of richness, in terms of uh, consistency also of, uh, of notes. So I find that the evolution is never a straight line when it comes to Barolo. It's always about the ups and downs. So it's a, a matter of a moment in which you're tasting them. And the beauty is that there's not a moment that is similar to another one. So every experience is a new one. Even if you're tasting the same vintage uh, from uh, the same single vineyard and from the same producer. So, but all it's really about surprises. And uh, I loved your analogy because it's, it really makes me think of this beautiful grape, which um, is Nebbiolo, that from certain soils shows us uh, so much fruit. And then when it comes to other types of soil, shows more spices and then it comes to leather. So it always feels like, okay, I'm getting what Nebbiolo finally is, but then there is one more door to open and a whole new world to discover. So it doesn't even feel to me that I'm familiar with this break 100% because it's really about the glimpses. It's uh, all the emotions that you feel for a moment and then they are immediately followed by another one, which comes again and again. And uh, it's a continuous surprise, as I said. And to me, especially Sarmasa single vineyard is that magnetic expression of Barolo, which makes you stick your nose in the glass and you never want to take it away if not to just change a moment eh? and then full immersion again in what Nebbiolo shows from Sarmassa. It's so uh, um, uh, beautiful, the fact that notes really follow one the other, show a little bit and then to me it's quite shy. You know, they um, tell you a little bit of their personality and then they close up again and uh, it's all your job to discover them again. <laughs> Valentina, of the three crews that you make, is Sarmasa your favorite? It's difficult to, to say what your favorite Barolo is and what my favorite Barolo is to me because there are so many expressions and especially when there are your wines. I don't have kids yet, but I didn't <laughs> understand this until uh, I was older, but my mom and dad used to tell me, it's like choosing between you and your brother. And in my mind, I always had a very clear answer. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but of course, it's difficult to say that we have only one favorite Barolo because they're all part of our family and they're all beautiful for different reasons. Uh, Sarmasa is surely um, a very intriguing expression of Barolo, as I said, very magnetic. So it's probably the one that gives me the greatest satisfaction when it comes to tasting, because it's always a new challenge uh, for me in uh, getting to know it uh, very well. So uh, it's, um, it's really like the mystery men that you want to um, keep on knowing better and better. I think it's interesting that the three of us keep anthropomorphizing Nebbiolo because because it's so unique. You really you can't describe it in any other way other than describe it in human terms, you know, with a specific personalities and um, because it's just it's just so complex and it's just has so much to offer. You can't just put it to a color or a flavor. You have to dress it up with a personality and um, so tell us about Sarmasa. How big is it and how much of it do you own? And what does the what does the soil look like? And how is how is Sarmasa different from your other crews? Well, every crew is different from the other because of soil, because of exposure, because of altitude. The, um, so in general, what we call terroir. The three that we decided to vinify uh, separately as single vineyards, in fact, uh, all come from the same village, Barolo. They are about at the same altitude, uh, uh, between 230 and 250 meters above sea level. And the exposure of the vineyard is facing southeast uh, and east. Uh, so they're very much similar in these terms, but soils changes enormously between uh, Costa di Rose, Canubi, and finally Sarmassa, which are the free crews that my family has as single vineyards, vinifies as single vineyards. 
Sarmas, it's def definitely the vineyard in Barolo uh, that has the greatest uh, um, austerity, also in terms of soils. As a matter of fact, it's one of the oldest vineyards um, that we have in the village of Barolo. So very compact and stony soils with a little percentage of sand, more clay and limestone. Therefore, the roots have to dig very much into deep. And that's probably why I tend to reflect myself in Sarmasa. Just as you said, I address it with human qualities because it, it's like a person that has a challenging time, has a challenging life. Not that I have one, but I can really picture myself in that situation because to reach its final objective, which is surviving in the case of the vine, um, they really have to work hard and too deep to find some nutrients. So the grape itself is small uh, because there is very little water in the grape and there is a lot of concentration. So all the notes that we find in Sarmasa are so concentrated because of this tough life that the vine has on that vineyard, which is uh, around 30 hectares big and we own three hectares. So it's a very tiny pot, which we still feel is uh, worth to be shown as a single one because of this very strong identity that it has. It's, it's fun hearing both of you talk and, you know, and definitely the, you know, personalizing the wine. Um, Julie, as you know, I usually will, you know, kind of go down the musical path. Yeah. And, you know, kind of analogize wine to music. And Nebbiolo to me has always been like the bass. And like when you're, especially when you're in a club or a, at a live concert, that like you can feel the bass, like a great drummer will shine in person. Like sometimes you don't pick that up in recording, but in person you feel the power of the bass. And to me, there's no grape that you feel like this. There's just an oomph on the back end and the finish. And maybe it's that searching for the nutrients, but there's a presence there that is sometimes very difficult to describe, but you, it's more you feel it. And to me, that's one thing I love about Nebbiolo. And I don't get that in any really other grape where it just, it has that low end. It's got the oomph. It brings the base. So it's a pretty special uh, grape and wine. Um, Valentina, I, I, I know we've got to wrap up here in just a moment, but I do have one question for you because um, I was born and raised in Napa, and I felt like it was terrible growing up in that small little farm town. And then I was reading that Barolo has 700 people. So how was it growing up in what is actually a even smaller farm town? Well, this is interesting because uh, you would think that when you grow in Barolo, when you grow up in Barolo, you're the luckiest person on earth because it's really a paradise. It's, uh, it's beautiful. We are surrounded by vineyards. We make wine, which it's famous all over the world because of these vineyards, because of these uh, terroirs uh, that we have here and that are unique. So uh, we make a wine that is unrepeatable in any other place on earth. So um, uh, you would think that, you know, a girl here is, is very spoiled. Uh, reality is that Barolo being so small can be a little bit claustrophobic when you're little, uh, probably because you don't understand wine, you get used to having wine at every uh, meal and, uh, and your parents talk about wine every single day and uh, the parents of your friends talk about wine every single day. So I felt the need of escaping when I was uh, in my... <laughs> Uh, teens, later teens, uh, I moved uh, to Milan for university and from there I started traveling. But guess what? I ended up in China uh, where I was working for a consulting firm and uh, I had nothing, which had nothing to do with wine and I start missing it. So I start missing talking about a war. I start missing smelling my hometown in a glass. And just when my mom came for a trip, uh, a business trip in Asia and I joined her, and I started talking finally about wine again and Barolo through the wine, I realized that my life could be nowhere far from Barolo, at least from, uh, from the juice from Barolo. So I came back and uh, uh, I must say that here we really live the dream. In, uh, in these days, we had the opportunity of uh, walking around the different vineyards and feeling the difference of each one of them under our feet. And it's just beautiful to see how they reflect on wine. and. Uh, reality is that when we deal with wine, when we work with wine, 
then we are working and, and dealing with any other thing. We relate to, as we just said, to human beings, we relate to music, to whatever makes us feel most comfortable. Because wine is uh, very versatile. We have wine in any moment, in happy moments, in sad moments, when we have to celebrate something, or maybe even when we are a little bored and we need a, a kick, then we have wine. So it's, um, uh, it's a way to be in, uh, in any moment and uh, uh, to, um, to feel home everywhere I am, thanks to the juice. Oh. Well, I am very thankful that you decided to come back and I feel that the winery and the village is all the better for it. So this has been an absolute joy to taste and uh, share the wines with you today. Um, Julie, amazing tasting notes as always. It's every time tasting with you learn something new. So well, always a treat. When you have great wines to taste. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you both. And uh, I'm going to go drink some Barolo now. Cheers. Cheers to everyone. Thank you. I wait for you in Barolo very soon, as soon as we can travel. Yes, yes please. <laughs>